prior to the next meeting. Um, I imagine the parking lot's gonna be pretty full. First, I wanna say thank you for coming back and doing with this with me a second time. I recognize that that's rather inconvenient. Um, I think the idea was I needed to put a bit more detail and uh, the percentages and, and that kind of data right into the reports. So the essence of what I said last time is still very much the same. Um, but the reality is now I've got the data in there, in the document for you to peruse and to see it. Did you all get this document via email? Yes. yes. Okay. And if you need a copy, actually, could you get that? Um, and this is just the abbreviated version, by the way. <laughs> so there's, the, there's a lot more data that's actually uh, not included here. But I thought maybe we could just kind of talk about some of the, the changes perhaps from last time. And I know Nathan had wanted me to address the staffing um, recruitment and retention piece. And I think that I would be happy to share that this time. Um, but essentially, I think what we got out of the last one is that the big question is, is the center offering programs in which students are choosing to enroll? And our answer is yes, that we offer 12 programs and if you look at our enrollments, it has increased from 105 students in the fall of 2020 to 170 students in the fall of 2022. Um, this can be attributed to direct communication and marketing that we've been doing um, over the last two years. Um, all of our programs have fairly full capacity, but I wanna just kind of outline more specifically for you that was not in the last report. Automotive, healthcare, electrical technology, criminal justice and cybersecurity, and culinary arts and hospitality were the programs that had a pretty extensive wait list and that we could absolutely have more kids if we could have accepted them. Um, so in those areas, there's definitely opportunity to expand um, both space and professional staff, but at this time, that's not feasible. Um, construction trades, diesel, dental, education, digital film, and diversified ag and advanced manufacturing are also showing a lot of growth. So although they are not necessarily, they may be at capacity, but they haven't had extensive wait lists. So they're, they're right where we want them to be. Um, shows the need is met. And then um, there are two programs or excuse me, there, there's one area that is not currently being met, and I think we talked about this last time, and that is an HVAC and plumbing program. Um, and at this time, there's just not space for that, but I will talk about that again in a minute um, as we talk about facilities. So all of the programs are supported within our region and our local labor market data. There are only two programs that the state identified that were on the maybe list, and that was culinary arts and hospitality and digital film. And through the process of the data we collected and the CLNA, um, it's clear that we can confidently say that it's important for our local economy to maintain culinary um, and hospitality. hospitality. There was an incredible amount of job opportunity out there right now. Um, and then it is also our belief that given the understanding of technology and the ability to work remotely, that we can support our digital film students with a, a digital economy um, that hopefully Central Vermont will be growing. So that was one thing that we didn't talk about last time. Um, we have only two programs that have fairly low enrollment right now, and those are education services and dental assisting. So they're somewhat an anomaly in, in our school at this point. Dental is obviously a fairly new program and its growth since this data is, is great. I think we have six in there now, no, five in there. Six in there now. Um, so that grew from four last year. And education grew from four last year to eight, I think, in there this year. Um, so those programs are growing, I think the the curriculum for education is changing in such a way that it's gonna be more broad and less focused on early childhood and early elementary and will be a little bit more broad including or being inclusive of the higher grades. So kids that maybe wanna be a high school art teacher like myself might see themselves in that program. 
Um, so it's changing what we, how we sell the program, I think, that's going to be important as we move into the new curriculum. Um, I think the rest, we talked a, a bit last time, I just want to kind of reiterate this in terms of size, scope, and quality that every program should offer either an industry recognized credential or a dual enrollment opportunity. And we had three programs that did not have either. Um, advanced manufacturing, culinary arts, and criminal justice and cybersecurity. Um, of these, advanced manufacturing, this year we'll be working on collaboration with VTC and also getting certifi certification for SolidWorks and Fusion 360 for the kiddos. Um, that's under the direction of a new instructor. Criminal justice and cyber security is kind of in a weird spot because the state hasn't recognized an industry credential for them. So we're waiting to kind of see what they do, but in the meantime, our instructor is working with colleagues around the state to try to identify that. So he's, he's right there in the thick of it. Um, and then culinary arts, the reason we didn't have a tier two is I think just confusion of what the tier one and tier two were. We always had offered Serve Safe, um, but Serve Safe has multiple different certifications, and the food handler one, which we always offered, is now considered a tier one. And we need to move into the manager one in order for it to be considered a tier two. Um, and we have two programs that offer both tier two IRCs and uh, college credit and those are education services and health careers. Um, currently, all of our programs are working on the alignment to our Agency of Education Proficiencies, which I think I might have also mentioned last time. We're in the process of doing our scope and sequence, which is helping us with that work. Um, it's an expectation of this Perkins Fund and the AOE for that to happen, and, um, and that work is underway. So that's an area that needs improvement, but we're, we've already started the work. Um, five of our 12 programs did not participate in CTSOs, which is uh, student organizations that are for leadership. And I think, you know, part of that number is skewed because of COVID. A lot of the student leadership organizations were either digital conferences, and I think at that point kids had just had about enough of um, talking to people online. So. I don't think they were all that interested in those opportunities. And now that we're going back to live um, conferences, I think we'll see some growth in that. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the things to just point out, and I sort of hinted at it earlier, is that in order to improve program size for some of these programs that are with wait lists, we would need to think about additional infrastructure. Um, Ideally, that could be a new building, but it also could be a, an addition. And um, I'll note later, actually I'll just say it now, there is one area of the school that I believe belongs to the tech center that has been utilized by RU for many, many years, back to when I was there, and I don't know if it's known, but the, um, I think the PBL lab is actually technically part of the tech center. Um, when they built the buildings that stretch kind of connecting the two. Um, there is a process that we could go through to acquire that space back. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good solution, just kind of depends where we end up with our, uh, in our building facilities review that we're gonna be going through and see where we are. But that's just something to make note of, that that space is potentially available if we wanted to go through the process, which does require uh, a pretty extensive process through the AOE. Um, right. Sorry, that yes. Are you thinking you'd bring in a new program like plumbing, or would you expand on an already growing class? I think where we could really use space is to increase our academics. Okay. So I could see that space being a really lovely, uh, like two classrooms for academics with the idea that potentially we might be able to open up something down on the other end if we did that, which could give us the, the room we need for HVAC and plumbing. Okay. Um, but again, you know, we're just kind of on a holding pattern until we know where our building's at, so. Um, all right. Um, so 
it might be helpful just to kind of hear what some of the tier two credentials are that programs are earning. Six of our 11 programs earned tier two credentials, and that was automotive technology with ASE and Vermont State Inspection certifications, construction trades and management, which they earned the NCCER core and Carpentry One, diesel technology, which also passed the ASE testing, diversified ag, which has the game of logging, tractor safety, tree climbing for arborists, electrical, which they complete the level one apprenticeship exam and health careers where they earn their LA, LNA. Um, and actually health careers this year is adding a, what is the pathway? Medical assisting pathway so that kiddos will have a choice depending kind of on their interest area because a lot of the content is very similar. Um, so. All right. Um, some of the, we talked about this last time, and I don't think I need to really go into it. There are some barriers in programs being able to offer dual enrollment. One uh, of the barriers is just academic readiness. Um, we need to have students demonstrating that they can handle that academic lift. We also are having some challenges getting staff approved for Fast Forward because it typically requires a college degree. And many of our industry folks may not have. And you know, does that mean that there are kids that can't earn college credit? No, I think we have to just think a little bit more creatively uh, in talking with, for example, our health careers teacher today, it became apparent that there's a class that education, dental assisting, and health careers all take for dual enrollment. So why not combine forces if not everybody's able to do that, um, to teach that course? So that just makes sense to collaborate across our programs in certain situations. And we can also develop uh, college credit opportunities through our work-based learning program, which is an area that I have not seen in my time since I've been there. And so I think that'd be great. Right. And just so you know, there are handy dandy little charts that in both the size, scope, and quality section and the program of study, if you really just want to sit there and kind of look at it in a comparison way, um, it makes it visually understandable which programs have some areas to work on and, and where we as a center have areas to work on. All right. Um, all of our programs, well, like I said earlier, 10 of our 12 programs actually meet our labor market um, requirements. And then the two that were maybes, we determined through the labor market analysis that they were needed in our region. And I don't think there's anything more I really need to say on that. There's a lot of information within the document that you're welcome to, to peruse and ask questions if you have them. Um, I don't think I need to do any of that. Um, one note that I don't remember making last time is that um, they asked the question which of our graduates are thriving in industry or in the labor market and why? And it seems like um, anecdotally, it appears that students that participated in CTSOs or completed a work-based learning placement or obtained one or more industry credentials or took college credit while with us seem to move more confidently into their post-secondary plans um, so it's hard to substantiate that with data, but I think if you were to um, ask graduates a few years down the road, we would have that information um, to see what actually helped them to succeed in their post-secondary plans. Um, and we do have a 96% placement rating, just you know, which I think is really positive. That's, that's a pretty high number. Um, Yeah, I really, I really don't want to go through all of this, the, the accountability data. Uh, I think it's there for you in the summary. Um, I think if you want to summarize in a very quick way, what are some areas that we need to work on? Um, because we are not proficient in reading and language arts, we are at a 22.55% proficiency rate where the average for the state is 36.58. So 
So that's clear that we need to do some interventions there. Um, similarly, if you look at our proficiency in math, we are at a 28.15% proficiency rate, where the state is at 40.02. So significant discrepancy there. Uh, I do think some of this is related to COVID and the sort of lack of consistency. I'm hoping that it's a bubble that we'll work through, but I think in the meantime, we've got some work to do. Um, similarly, in science, although the data that we have did not represent everybody, um, and I'm not sure how, why that was, if it was a choice to take that, that year or not, or if our schools just didn't give us the data, um, but we had a 10.26% proficiency rate in science and the state average is 23.97. So um, clearly academics are an area of concern for us. And mentioned last time we have two academic teachers, one math, one English slash humanities, and they see all of our students. So that is 155 I think we're at at this point. Um, it's a lot of kids for one teacher. Yeah, from that perspective, English teachers, you don't ever want to see them other disciplines you don't ever want to see them on. Yeah. Is there like that statewide or? No, I think you'll see that the other full day centers are in areas where they just, I'm not sure how, how the Perkins funding is allocated. I know there's a formula and it's based a lot on um, income sensitivity, I think, I believe, and then population. So when you look at like a Stafford in Rutland, mm -hmm. I mean their, their Perkins grant is about $325,000, which would be amazing if we could ever get that. So it's hard because they have the numbers to support a regular budget, but they still get more funding because of the formula and the way it's set. Um, we don't have the budget to support those positions unless we raise tuition. And I think that's something that we have to talk about at some point. So, any other questions on that? Is our tuition substantially lower than other centers? Where we We're kind of in the middle. It's, right? it's complicated. Um, our tuition is actually probably about average, okay. but we're a full day program where most of the others are half. Okay. So they're getting more for the, for the buck. Right. Well, actually though, if they're a half day center, they cut that tuition in half. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, I had that conversation with Jason way back around. So. Well, at least that's how it was in Hartford anyway. So, okay. I, so it would be one student counts as half a FTE. Gotcha. If that makes sense. That actually, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, is, to bring up the kind of taking outside the box, is, is the high school at max capacity for English and math a kid ratio to teacher? Uh, their data is, they're probably sitting around 16 to 19 kids per class. Um, that is unusually low in my experience, but it is not inappropriate for what we have for students and what we're working with and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's, they're about where they should be. Could the academic overflow of students that come from Randolph be taught over there they, offset some of the yeah, they do, and then what ends up happening is because we are not the same, we're like different cost centers, right. we charge them tuition for the students that come over. Right. Um, so if, if you look at that, it, it might be cost effective depending upon how many kids there are to send them over, but if it requires us to purchase a whole new teacher, right. um, then, it then, then it's not going to be. So right. yeah, there, right. there is a little bit of leeway. The, the biggest problem, and Felicia can, can probably talk about it more eloquently than I can, is that um, we have to change the master schedule of the high school to meet the needs, right? Because right. they've got their time in their RTCC program uh, to do the work over there, and it would be nice, if, you know, if we got to do this, it's, let's make sure they all have it in the morning, and let's make sure they all have it in the afternoon. Right. Yeah. Um, Try so to make it as less disruptive. And that's, possible. you know, back in our day, kids were that's where we got our academics from RTCC right. um, was to go over to RU and. It was a, it, and even up until this year, it was a constant pullout, even in our school, having two instructors. Um, so this year, one of the things that we've done to hopefully help with the academic 
um, discrepancy on proficiency, but also to streamline our schedule was every kid takes um, the integrated math and every kid takes the integrated English, which is um, related to their program, but meeting those basic proficiencies. And they're also through those two uh, classes being engaged in the work keys curriculum, which can be diagnostic. They'll take like a test and they can understand what areas they need to do more work and that helps the teacher understand what areas they need to, to focus on with individual students. Um, so I think it's a more solid plan because it's not so all over the place. Um, You're gonna, she's gonna have more resources in another year or two because the enrollments are up. Right. Um, when the enrollments are up, right, it's economy of scale, you get more students, you get more money. Um, but the problem is, is that the way the formula works from the state is that it's based on a six semester average, a three year average. So she's dealing with 160 some odd kids this year, um, but she's only getting funding. I did the calculations for the budget last year. She's only getting funding for 124 because that hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. And so she's in a tough, tough spot trying to serve all those kids with Less. not enough money. Yeah. And okay. it's something and next year they'll base it on. It'll come up a little bit more and by year three. If, if she stays right at the same number she's got, it'll catch up. And then, you know, either she keeps tuitions the same and uses the extra resources to, to buy more staff or, um, you know, uses some of the model. Yeah. Which is more likely. That's, that's just got to get there. We just got to get there. Yeah, it's a waiting game. And, and the other piece of it, too, is even, you know, as we work our tails off to get to that uh, magic number, there's also discussion about changing the funding process for tech ed at the state level. So. Who knows? One way or another, I'm hopeful that <laughs> something right. will change. Yeah. Yes. The big, big question is, is did the state do its study committee yet? Because you know they won't make a decision until they've done their study committee. Yes, I think they finally sourced someone to do their study. Well, it's probably about a year away then. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, do, do, do. Just trying to see if there's anything specifically. Uh, just, you know, a note that I think is important. Um, our economically disadvantaged students are at or above the average performance of our center in almost all accountability measures. So I think it's one of the Perkins things they want us to really look at is dis, you know, disaggregated data and to see where we might have areas that are weak. Um, but our four and six year graduation rates for our special populations are in line with the average for RTCC. So really, I think it's as a center, our need for academic proficiency is there. Um, right, I think what I'd like to move into next, let's see if it's the right section. I know Nathan, you wanted to talk a bit about faculty and staff. So I added a substantial amount to this section because at this point, RTCC has more than tripled the level of staff turnover than any other CTE center in the state. And that, that's not, a, I mean, it's a positive and it's not a positive. Um, I think that it's brought new life to our, our programs and our school, um, but at the same time, it's a lot of inexperience that we're, we're kind of you know, learning and, and doing this together as a team. Licensure. And licensure, yes. Um, so just to kind of give you, though, an idea, because I think sometimes people say, wow, like, what's going wrong there? I want to I wanna just outline why people got done. Yeah. Um, we had five folks retire. We had two that did not sign their contract by the deadline. We had three that moved to other vacancies within our own school. And we had two that moved into vacancies within the district. We had one that went to a higher paying tech center, and we had one that got a job closer to home. So it's important, I think, to hear that so that it's, you know, the context is important. And I'm, I, don't, I know you guys can read, but I want to read this part too, because I think for me it's personally important. Um, I was hired after a director that the staff really loved uh, decided to go to Burlington. And in that time, he didn't give the staff a whole lot of notice. They were remote. I don't feel like they thought they got to say their goodbyes. Um, and it was really kind of hard for them. I think they were hurting. And then the changes that I had to make in order to be COVID compliant meant 
like hybrid learning modality, keeping groups of students self-contained, losing lunchtime, eating outside, electronic forms that they weren't used to and they weren't very technologically savvy, um, and then electronic meetings and communication systems. And so this was like challenging to implement those changes and the staff had kind of been used to doing it their way. Um, so it was hard um, and created a little bit of a challenge. In the fall of 2020, um, that was the lowest enrollment that RTCC had had that I could see for quite some time. And a lot of this was due to COVID and the inability for uh, RTCC to recruit in that spring. And decision around the recruitment cycles and program closures were made by me to ensure that programs were of adequate size, scope, and quality and had the necessary enrollments to be financially feasible prior to contracts being issued. There had been, in the past couple of years, two staff members who were issued contracts with zero students um, because the enrollment process had not concluded by the time contracts were issued. So this necessitated a change uh, in our recruitment timeline, which again is another change that everybody had to adapt to. Um, so we did have some staff members who did resign for various reasons, and you can read that. Um, and then we had one member take a, a leave of absence, which was well deserved. What questions on any of that? Not so much for you know why they chose to retire or move on, just more morale. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we have a lot of new uh, teachers and educators, um, there's a lot going on mm -hmm. in, in this town and in this district, and um, you can definitely tell after last night, especially hearing from some of the students, um, the tension there, and I just want to, you know, make sure that the staff know that, you know, we hear them, right, and, and we understand, but also that, you know, we want this to make an enjoyable experience for them as well, this is their career, they're teaching, right, and if they're happy and, and they're excited to teach, then that energy passes on to the kids, hopefully, right? And, and it creates a positive um, environment you know, because they're in the workforce, right? Uh, I think we've all had jobs that have really had bad morale and it's been really tough to, to work and I just can't imagine them learning, yeah. right? So, you know, just, yeah. just more of a morale and, you know, do they feel like they're backed up enough or do they have the, the resources need. available to them to become better teachers? And, yeah, it's, it's a, so actually that's gonna kind of lead into the next section sure. too. So this is actually a perfect segue. Um, this is the most positive beginning to a year that we've had since I've been here. And I think part of that is due to the fact that it feels more normal. Like we've started school in a normal way, um, like we used to. And I think um, part of that is the energy and excitement of our new staff. So it's, it's been really positive. And I think one of the things I note in here is that, you know, although we've had a lot of staff turnover, like we're looking at how do we how do we maintain this staff, how do we retain them, and I think, you know, one is is making the school great. So we work we're working on PD together. Currently, we're working on our scope and sequence. Um, we've also changed the leadership team so that it has more transparency and more participation, so that they feel like their voice is part of the decision making process. Um, We've refocused our attention on being student-centered versus adult-centered, and um, a lot of that's through revamping our MTSS system. We've also empowered students to have a voice through our ambassador program. Um, we've been making strides in building the bridges with our local community through uh, finally bringing this board into compliance, which uh, is great having you know, all of our partner school districts represented and um, our industry in the local area is tremendous. Um, and we're working on our program advisory committees to do the same. But we also, one of the things that's helpful for morale, I think that's been big this year, is the change of the master schedule. I think staff feel like the pace is better, like they can actually breathe and have um, some solid time with their students. So. More time to get into something get or go into do something. Or yes. Get into what they're teaching. Yes. Um, also, 
just one of the things I'm aware of is that the staff are in the process of uh, negotiating their new contract. And one of the things that they are asking for, which I do support, is that the contract language be changed so that if you have teaching experience, that's on a one-to-one -one scale. Um, currently, the way it's written, you would get half of a years of experience even if you've taught before. Um, so that's an area where they're looking at. And I think that will help us with retaining and also recruiting um, both. Yeah. It, it's, I don't know what age that language is from, yeah. it, is, it is archaic. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, you know, if I get somebody that comes in with, with 20 years experience, um, it takes, I have to take four of those years away to put them on step two, and then they get one additional step on the salary scale for every two years of service. Yeah. And, and so, that does not you include. Know, when we're competing with other districts um, right. that have, you know, they, they do pretty much the same thing they do for So what's the process of amending that or changing that? It's a negotiations yeah. process. Which is okay. this year. This year is a negotiation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think we're doing a lot of good work. And uh, it's important that we celebrate that, even though it sounds really crazy when you think about all the turnover. So. And do you find that the, the new staff that's bringing the energy is also pass on to the students, are they getting excited? Yeah. Do they feel like they just really want to? I feel positive energy throughout the school. I've okay. seen I've seen more activity, um, especially when the students do work outside of the school and out and about than I've ever seen before even mm -hmm. which is a good sign. There's so other excited good. people doing things that they haven't done before. Yeah. Good. That's great. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, if we're looking down the road, I think that there's some things that we can do to ensure that our staff don't leave. We'll be getting our uh, CTE school counselor back after her leave of absence. Currently, she's like Wonder Woman. I don't know how she does everything she does, um, but I think we need to look at potentially getting an outreach coordinator so that we can take that off her plate. Um, I was able to add the Dean of Students this year through ESSER funds. I'm hoping in two years that that will roll into an assistant director position, that our budget will support that. And then obviously we have the, the academic needs. And I think probably the most realistic solution with this Perkins plan is going to be for us to look at hiring a curriculum integrationist or coordinator to help us with our alignment and moving into proficiency-based grading. And then potentially when our budget catches up adding in those additional staff members. Plus if we have uh, building room assignment type stuff to go through, that's gonna take a little time. So. Um, did you secure the dental? Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so um, we came up with a, a creative solution because she was doing the work anyways of writing the curriculum for the days that she was not there. Um, so she is full-time, or will be, she's in the process of going through that. Um, and she's with our kids on all of her full days, all of their full days, and then on the days they have academics, um, she's writing curriculum, and the kids are going to their academics, and then we're gonna get them out on placement, so that they'll get some of the hours that they need. So really creative and, and good solution for everybody. And she is determined to get us CODA approved this spring. That's great. So, so it shapes the room. It's in great shape. <laughs> yes, it, really is. it is. It is in great shape, and um, she has like gone through that room and organized it. It's been nice to see hands-on work happening. That was a loaded question because I didn't answer. I know, answer. <laughs> I know it was. <laughs> I didn't bite though. <laughs> uh, um, so I guess that's really it. Unless there's other questions that folks have for me. I don't think we really need to talk about professional development, but um, if you want to, you can see our professional development plan is in there for this year. Um, you can also see that maybe we need to work a little bit on uh, our recruitment of students in non-traditional programs. And that includes boys into non-traditional programs. We've, we've done a great job with our female middle schoolers, and we have not done that with the boys. 
would it be helpful to have um, men in the field that are working mm -hmm. to come in and talk? Absolutely. I mean, I know my brother-in-law's good friend is a male nurse. He's in high demand. Um, he can take his pick of a lot of where he'd like to work at whatever hospital in New England. Um, is that, you know, would that be someone that be like, hey, if you like helping people in? Prior to COVID, they used to do okay. that like a couple times a week. Yeah. Oh, that was okay. a big piece of them, but I think a lot of it. I think that, yeah, we, we still do, but also what's happened a lot is now it's a virtual, uh, like a virtual meeting. So yeah. we used to have people in a ton. Um, but there's always, that's a great opportunity. I would love to do that. Yep. Um, we do do that with, like, for example, a female electrician we had uh, through Vermont Works for Women. And, um, you know, they, she was presenting to all of the kids, but it was great because the girls in the class were like, oh, I can see right. myself now. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's half of it. Yep. That's half of it. Yep. Well, with that, um, I know we don't have our chair here, but I'd like to see if we have a motion to approve the new and updated CLNA. Uh, so moved. Second. Third. Yes, I did. Okay. And um, there's one item on our consent agenda that I just want to, uh, I, I don't have the document here, but there is a form, I think it's 276, that is required, 267, maybe. It's a form that is required for us to pool funds from Perkins, and um, it helps pay for our teacher prep program and our CTSOs. Yep. And so I just need board approval to sign that document and move forward with that. So if I had a motion for that, that would be amazing. I think it's form 267. I'll, I'll tell you it when we get back to school. Oh, that all the all the CTOs pull their money together into one lot yeah. to support this work. It's usually through Vermont Tech. So all of it, yeah, all um, the cities. And we actually they've twisted our arms into actually managing the money for the for the group issues. Yeah, I know we should get, we should get some benefit for <laughs> well, that. I think still haven't figured out why why I asked, but that's okay. Well, I think what it was is because we're now housing all of the other money. Yeah. So Robin is managing every other state account there is that's related to technical education, except for maybe the adult ed. Or did I don't do? think I have adult ed yet. <laughs> so we're I have the counselors, I have everything else. Yeah. So, so since we're advisory, I'll make the motion. All right, thank you. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And with that, uh, there's no need for executive sessions, so. I would do, I would call for actual votes though. Oh, sorry, oh. so could I have, all those in favor of the two motions on the table, say aye. 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 Thank you. Right. And I think that's what I've got for you. So if anybody has any questions, speak now. I, not so much for this session, but I think down the road, you know, we talked about what direction the school's gonna go, new building, new facilities and all that. Would, I'd like to bring up the subject down the road. Is that gonna expand our offerings to other towns besides current ones that we currently use our facilities for the tech school. If we increase our um, capacity of having students come in, could it reach farther than? That's state uh, determined. That's, yeah, okay. that's a state question. We, we do get odd students and other CTOs get odd students. I don't mean odd the students themselves, right. but if we offer a program that they can't get anywhere else, and they're allowed to come here. Okay. So that's why when we looked at programming, like dental assisting is a win for us because we can get kids from Spalding, U32, maybe White River. Right. Right. It's a, it's a magnet. Yeah. So so it's important as we look at programming that there's definitely a need, and that was that was one that was definitely there. So. Perfect. Yeah. A good okay. question though. Have you um, had the PC? Not yet. That, Say that again? The PCB testing is sometime in October. It's so, been yeah, so the, the, the discussion, okay. we had, had a really good open forum discussion with like 30 to 50 people there. And we were talking about, you know, we've got these conditions that are coming together to potentially be able to, you know, renovate the building. We've got the legislature looking at funds for um, building renewal um, and the PCB testing. And we've got two schools that are old enough that it is probable. Right, that will have those sits. So we were scheduled for this month. We just got the 
the um, piece from the state that they're moving, I think it's to 2025. Uh -huh. So I may go ahead and do the testing anyway. Okay. Because again, I, I would like to try, we've got a lot of pieces that when we, at the regular board meeting when we talk about facilities the next round, there are a lot of repairs and things that need to happen, things that are, are need to be replaced, and the cost of some of those is so high, it's like, right. you know what, if we're, if we're hitting these and getting things that are this big three or four times a year, it might be time. Right. Yeah. So, plus, plus we were the school that was found by the state to be the closest to the end of its useful life. Yeah. Okay. So those will be ongoing discussions. And I, you yeah. know, if all else, the shops in particular in our school need to be gutted, and I think we're we're looking at starting with construction um, sometime soon, hopefully. And um, but if we're going to stay in the building, that needs to happen because everything is just out of date and potentially out of OSHA compliance. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.